going live. It says it says we're live. I don't know if that's actually true, so we'll we'll just assume it's true. Hello and welcome to everyone. I can see that I have um, an ad, so that tells me that we probably are live. <laughs> well, that's good. Okay, so everybody meet Jess. Hi. From Penny River Costumes, and today she yeah. is going to show us how to make 18th century mitts. Yeah. And while she does that, I am going to try and bombard her with questions. I'm so while she's sewing. I'm so nervous and also so excited. Did you watch my live stream yesterday? I didn't. I was going yes. to noon and then I didn't. And then it's better because I asked Marika the questions and I didn't oh, want right. you to know. All right. Completely fresh then. Uh, can you hear me? Is my sound okay? I'm good. I'm good. Can you guys hear me? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just trying a new microphone. So I wanted to see if it was better than the video yesterday. Okay. Okay. So why don't you go ahead and give us an overview about mitts and like what the deal is and tell us what we need to get started on mitts. I know there are people in the audience right now that have kits already and are possibly sewing along with us. So that's yeah. exciting. Yeah. I shipped one in a, in a, like a frenzy on Tuesday. Who was it? Um, uh, Carla, tiny. Angry oh Brad. yeah. Is there any way I can get it? I was like, I'm taking it right now. And so I <laughs> That's awesome. The office and she got it. So, um, hi, if you're here, we're going to make mitts. Um, okay. So mitts, um, in the, um, 18th century, it was very, very common stylistically for sleeves to end at the elbow. And as far as I can tell, that's a holdover from um, mantuas in the early 18th century, where the fabric was like so wide, and then it draped over the arm and the body, and naturally just it ended here. And I think like 18th century sleeves are basically like mantua sleeves that then become modern sleeves. And this is kind of like the transition part, as far as I can tell. I mean, I could be completely wrong, but that's what I think. also you got to keep yourself warm exactly when it's cold and I'm in I'm in Pittsburgh I'm in Pennsylvania so our winters get cold and um it's yeah you need something on your arms but then it also in the summertime um there isn't sunscreen obviously and if you're outside this part of your arm will get a different color than the rest of you and like the weird sunburn <laughs> that happens see how my hands are not the same color as my face it's because I protect my arms there, well, yeah, there you go. Oh. <laughs> my left arm is always darker than my right because I drive. Mm -hmm. And I used to always have like when I wore a watch, I would always have a watch tan. Um, yep. But anyway, so you want sun protection or you want warmth or you want some combination of that. And that's where mitts come in. So it's a fingerless glove that has a fitted thumb and usually um, has um, a decorative piece of fabric that goes on top of your fingers just to like cover them and then folds back and then is pretty yeah um, yeah um they're cut on the bias which is different than pretty much all of historical like 18th century sewing is almost entirely cut on the straight of grain because that conserves fabric but mm -hmm. because of the fitted nature of your i mean this is the most flexible part and the most used part of your entire body so having something that's on the straight of grain wouldn't wouldn't work here. It has to be something that's stretchy and that's fitted. And before we had um, elastic, um, bias was the solution to that or knitting. So um, mitts uh, can be made out of a variety of materials. Um, I have seen um, in portraiture an awful lot of silk and silk satin and a lot of leather um, on upper class ladies. When you get into the middling and lower class um, uh, with like milliner's ads and runaway ads and um, portraiture and like etchings and things like that, you start to see things that I would characterize as linen. Um, and there is an example, there's one extant example of a cotton set that's a nice lightweight fine muslin, but mm. I think they're kind of like maybe crossing the line of like 1790s, maybe early 19th century. Um, I mean, you could still make them for those years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you want them, make them. I um, want them. I want them for 2020, but I, mean, I don't go outside. So I guess it doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, well, this year anyway, maybe 2021 we'll have yeah. its revolution. Um, but they're wonderfully lightweight. Like you wouldn't think it but when you cover, like when you block the sun from getting on your skin and then you allow like a breeze to go through, it's like so cooling. It's, it's air like, conditioning. It's great. It really is. They're wonderful. Um, and then in the winter time, I have some that I can show you. I like to make them 
with unlined, really, really soft wool. And my favorite, and um, this may or may not be historically accurate, but it's super comfy, is when the wool has a little bit of cashmere in it. Uh huh. They're super soft, and you, it's basically like coating, like um, cashmere yeah. coat fabric. And um, they're like, it's amazing how keeping your wrist and this blood supply warm will keep your whole body warm. Absolutely. It's like if you're super, super hot and you put like a cold can of pop or like an ice pack on your wrists, it'll cool your whole body. Yeah. All right. What do we need to, to make some mitts? Like what does okay. the, the kit include? The kit includes like pre-cut fabric. So if you have that, you're good. Otherwise, I do have a pattern available. I'm working on PDFs. My skill set is firmly not in the 21st century. And so I'm working on downloads for that. Um, but uh, there's a pattern in the American Duchess book that's awesome. There's also a pattern in costume close up if you have that and want to just like go for it. I can tell you how to adapt it, the, the modifications that I've found because I've made a, over a hundred pairs of these in the last three years. So I, I know how to make it fit you <laughs> and I know how to like tweak it. Um, a but, bunch of those are in my house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we will get you a fully set a fully like made pair of mitts at some point um I mean I should make a fully made pair of mitts I just keep getting distracted it's on my board though it says three <laughs> pairs of mitts okay all right well yeah. make one first and yeah. <laughs> see how it goes um okay so you need the fabric and um I have mine if you can see on my table I have mine right here it's blue it's linen um if you're going to make it out of a piece of scrap fabric, that's totally legitimate. It's very historically accurate. Um, they, uh, if you're doing that, they usually end up being pieced like here-ish. I don't know if you can see my hand. Can yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, they end up being pieced like here because if it's like a straight of grain piece, that's usually where like the end will hang off and then you just like stick another piece on there. Um, but uh, the pattern itself needs to be, so you have 14 inches on the bias. Okay. Um, you need two pieces that are 14 inches on the bias and it can be any woven. Um, okay. I recommend linen if you want to do it or a nice heavyweight wool. Silk taffeta for a starter. Silk taffeta is just hard to sew. Like a nice tightly woven silk taffeta I find is like a little bit more difficult to get the fine stitching because you need to pick up like a single thread at a time. And I, I personally find that a little bit difficult. I just put it on the machine. <laughs> oh, well, that works too. That totally works. Yeah. <laughs> That totally works. Um, and then for your lining, the, the ones that I'm going to show you how to make are unlined. You could potentially, if you wanted to make them a little bit warmer or you find wool itchy or whatever reason, you can make them so that they're fully lined. And I have a pair here that's fully lined and it's just a really lightweight wool with a linen lining. It's and like bag lined. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just make two of them and then you just stick them together and just like stitch them around the top. Yeah. Um, and then are, proceed as normal. Proceed as normal. Um, these, I actually don't own a pair of mitts because whenever I make them, I sell them. These oh. are my sisters <laughs> who has like incredibly skinny arms and I can't even put them on because her like her wrists are like four and a half inches. Cool. All right. So you need a um, bias cut fabric in your pattern. You need thumb pieces and you need that little arky thing, right? Yeah. And this is, this is, this is exactly that. I guess it's the other one. Um, your, your decorative tip your decorative point and yes. it can be anything this is a piece of um block print cotton I used to carry this as a kerchief in my shop and they sold out and then I had like off cuts and so I was like those will be pretty as points um so that's what that is um, um my friend Amy is asking does the kit come in different sizes plus size lady here so generally bigger hands arms uh, girlfriend, I've got this kit and I have size 11 fingers on giant man hands. I have an eight hand. They fit me just fine. They'll fit you. Yeah. They, um, they fit up to, um, I think it's like an eight and a quarter hand and a 12 inch forearm. Yeah. Um, and they me. go down to like, um, a, a six and a half to, I think it's like an eight and a half. So it's, a, it's definitely a one size fits all. And I'll show you how to do the fitting part. So you're going to do the fitting on yourself. And if, if you are smaller, you're going to cut off a good bit of this. And if you're larger, you're going to like not have much seam allowance, but it's, it's totally like it works. Cool. Yeah. All right. Sewing. Okay. Um, for sewing, um, I have my little pin dish, which is magnetized and I love, um, I have with linen, I like to use cotton thread. I know that 
in like a historical sense, that's kind of like, you should use linen on linen, but you know, whatever. I use cotton. I like cotton. So this is a quilter's cotton. I buy it because it comes in giant spools. It's my favorite. So I have that and it's in a contrasting color so we can see the stitching. Um, my favorite embroidery scissors, which are unicorns. You can get these embroidery sister scissors and also that dish on her store as well. It's true. <laughs> I didn't even realize, but yes, you can. Um, and my favorite thimble, which is from Williamsburg um, from when I worked there. And then um, this is from Willoughby and Rose. It's like her mini waxes. I have and one of those. She has local, she has a friend that's a beekeeper and she gets like locally sourced, unprocessed and it smells amazing. It and does. It works so well. So Mine are packaged because I'm going to give them to friends for Christmas and I can smell it through the packaging. It's great. It's really nice. So yeah, Willoughby and Rose has these beautiful little, and they fit in your sewing kit, which is great. And they're not like too chunky. So I have this beautiful little thing. And then I have um, my needle and I've got some sewing pins. Um, if you have the kit, it, do it doesn't come with a thimble or wax, but it does come with everything else, including a needle and sewing pins. Oh, and um, embroidery thread, which I have around here somewhere. Um, the other things we're going to use in making these that's not included in the kit is some kind of marking tool. So I have um, a friction marker that's like a heat erasable and I've got a piece of Taylor's chalk. Um, I have a tape measure because at one point I'm going to show you how to measure your arms. And then I have a straight edge clear ruler because um, I use this to mark out my embroidery design. Uh, people are, in, are telling me that um, the link to your store is broken in my description. I will fix it right after this um, thing, but you can just look up Penny River Costumes on Penny River. Etsy. I think it's um, pennyriver.etsy.com. Yeah, great. Uh, there's also a coupon code for Mitt Kits and Patterns, and um, it's and free, free, shipping. free shipping. There's a free ship coupon, and the kits and patterns are on sale. Great. You can only put in one coupon code, so I had to do it that way. Yeah. Okay, sewing. Okay, are we ready to go? Yeah. All right, the order of operations that I do for this is thumbs, hems, points, <laughs> thumbs, points, seams. Okay. That makes any sense. We'll yes. get to it. Okay. Uh, so people in the comments, please let me know if you guys want me to make her hand down. part of the video be primary. Yeah, Amy, you're going to get one of those pineapple things. I already bought you one. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming already. It's coming. Okay. All right. So I am threaded. I am going to do thumbs. All right. I'm only going to make one mitt out of the set right now because a full set of mitts takes me three and a half hours fully hand sewing. We right. only have two. So I'm just going to do the one and we're going to talk while we do it. Perfect. Okay, so first you're, thing you're doing thumbs first. So you tell me thumbs. when you're just sewing a big hem and I'll start asking you my questions. Otherwise, cool. I'm going to let you roll on instructions. Okay, all right. Um, so here's your thumb. We're going to, <laughs> I forgot to turn off the notifications and I'm noticing people on my shop favoriting the kits. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm folding this down about, eh, it's like a quarter. It's like... I'm spotlighting um, your hands so people can okay. just see just you. Okay. Oh, sorry. I just had to hit my phone for a second. All right. So I finger press the very top of that down. That's like, eh, like a quarter, maybe three eighths, not three eighths, like three sixteenths of an inch. And I'm going to do what's called a ladder rolled hem. This is a cheater hem for rolling hems. I like to use this on the bias because it doesn't pull and stretch as much. And so this is one of my very favorite stitches and I'm gonna show it to you now. So I buried my knot in the fold. I'm gonna take a tiny sideways stitch right below this little flap of material and pull it. The first one's hard because you have to like direct the thread where to go. Stay forward. Okay, and then the second stitch is a little sideways stitch through the fold, through the very top of the fold. Mm. That's one, two, and that's our pattern. So we're gonna do one, two until we get about an inch of this done. So one, two. Is you there want a name for this stitch? This I call this a ladder rolled hem. Some people call it um, a self rolling hem. Yeah. Um, I have always wondered how to do this. Oh, I'm so excited to show you. This is my very favorite stitch. Except I'm so excited to have you on my channel, Jess. Thank you so much for having me. This is like amazing. And you were one of the very first like costumers, costume people that I started following when I got into this a couple, three-ish years ago. 
And to be here, I feel like I've arrived. (laughs) Oh, that's so cute. (laughs) Thank you so much. I don't feel like I've arrived. I'm just a girl in her sewing room with a camera. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I've got, I'm trying to think how many per inch do we have here? You know what? I can just find out here. How many stitches per inch do we have here? two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10-ish, 10, 10 to an inch-ish. All right, so once you've got about an inch or so, you don't wanna go beyond two inches or it's gonna be hard to pull. You want to hold firmly your knot and pull your thread and it- It's like magic. On itself. It's magic. Wow. I remember learning this stitch when I was working in um, the costume design center at Williamsburg and my, um, there were two of us that were like the summer, I don't know, people. And um, it was Blair who's doing uh, craft of coping. Oh yeah. We just had her video on um, Willoughby and Rose this morning or this afternoon, whatever. And um, she's the one that taught me this stitch. And I remember being like blown away, like what? Because it just made everything better. So many, so many of my favorite people come out of Williamsburg. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your history while you're sewing that? Oh, sure. Um, Okay. So I had a Felicity doll when I was a kid, (laughs) as many of us did. I just learned about Felicity. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know what that was until literally this whole thing exploded about it. Yeah. I think I might've started that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So yeah. Um, I had a Felicity doll. I was fully obsessed with 18th century, like colonial America. Um, And I remember my librarian when I was in the third grade telling me that there was a place that existed that was where Felicity lived and it was still like 18th century. And I was like, no way. There's a Felicity Disney World. And so I (laughs) made my parents take us there as like our summer vacation. And my mother, my sweet mother, made me the most amazing research-free historical costume that was like a blue denim dress <laughs> with a sunbonnet and I pre- I'm, I've shared pictures of it but it's it's epic and um Keds with uh with ruffle uh socks and I was just blown away I was like this is where I need to be yeah. and um, so that was age like nine um and then oh my I- god that's amazing just every time you do that I'm gonna scream that just so you I know, know it's so cool um so yeah I did that and then I went to school and I studied um theatrical costuming and history because there wasn't like a dress history option but that's what I really wanted to do um and then worked in the summers in the costume design center at Colonial Williamsburg I went to the University of Richmond so it wasn't that far away cool um and then um worked there for, uh, for until I got married, which was pretty close to be graduating from college and then moved back to Pittsburgh. And I was a teacher for a while and I taught sewing and I taught um, theater stuff. And then I had babies and then I started a business and that's the abbreviated how Penny River happened. Oh, that's awesome. I've only been to Williamsburg the one time. I think I went when I was probably I want to say like 13 or 14. And all I remember is the pigs. Oh gosh. Um, from going there. My my grandfather is named Charles Morgan. And there's a ship in um, I think it's Newport, Rhode Island, called the Charles W. Morgan. And it's his his great great grandfather's ship. Oh, cool. So and it's the last masted whaling ship in the world that's still functional. So we were going to see that. So we stopped somehow in Virginia on the way. <laughs> but um, I, I really want to go back. All right. So what's going on now? Okay, so now we have our little hem. Don't cut your thread because we're going to make our side seam. And because it is biased, sometimes you get these little like, nah, you just, yeah, trim. just cut that right off. Cut that right off. Don't be shy about trimming things. All right, so we are going to do a French seam. Oh, okay, yep. Okay, so French seams you do backwards mm-hmm. and half size. Yep. And then flip it and do the other size. So we're going to turn this so that the wrong side is actually together. So right sides are out. Right sides are out. And we're going to very close to the edge, like real close, real close. I'm going to make real close. three whip stitches just to hold the hem in place. Cause it's kind of chunky. And then I'm going to do some really tiny back stitches close to the edge. Cool. So like there. So if you guys can see it's real close. 
and they're low. And I'm sorry, my notifications for some reason are hanging on my computer. No worries. Turn them off. Um, okay, so while you're sewing that, do you want to start 20 questions? Sure. All right. I'm going to give you the one that blew everyone's mind yesterday, and this is a three-part question. Oh, gosh. Okay. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Oh, goodness. See, now that's, right? that's a thing. <laughs> because if you were to go to, like, Germany, they would say, no, it's a sausage with a wrapper. Yep. Uh, the wrapper's only there so you can hold it and eat it. You're using back stitches, yeah? I'm using back stitches and they're teeny. Okay. So what's your answer? Do you think do you think a hot dog is a sandwich? I would not categorize it as such, no. Even though it does have a bun, it's not flat. I feel like that's my my criteria for a sandwich. It's not So flat. do you think like a hoagie or a subway sandwich is not a sandwich then? Because those aren't flat either. They but they lay flat. No, subway sandwiches don't and neither do hoagies they're big rolls or like kaiser roll oh. right no keep sewing difficult yeah does it matter <laughs> that the meat is cylindrical rather than sliced i i, I go by the miriam webster definition so i so my husband and i had a big argument about it and i'm like i this is stupid we have the internet let's just look up what the definition of these things are That's fantastic. all right all right so the second question is is cereal soup I guess technically it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> you eat it with a spoon and it's wet, but it's cold and it's sweet. So it's not like... It's melon soup is a soup melon and it is cold and sweet. Melon soup is a soup. I don't know. Okay. Right? Okay. Here's the last one. This is the most controversial. Oh, gosh. Okay. Is lasagna a cake? I feel like a cake has to be sweet, though. Do you? I do. What about, what about crab cake? Oh gosh, but that's a patty. It's it's still a cake. It's still a cake, but you have br bread in it. But I guess you have bread and lasagna too, right? Oh no! Why are you confusing my food <laughs> categorizing? All okay. right. So are you just doing that one little seam right there? Yes, just this teeny seam. Um, this bit is what gets attached to the hand. Right. Probably. Okay. So what goes on your thumb so that's why you have it's like a chimney so you're making yep. a chimney. um i finished that bit i'm going to take my little scissors and very carefully just kind of go snip and don't clip into your thread yo Ooh, don't do that and then this part's kind of weird because i don't like to you don't have to cut your thread on this part which is kind of yep. cool so i'm gonna um pass my thread through to the right side yep like a boss yeah yep. and then flip the whole <laughs> thing to yep. the other side Looking good. Yeah. And now you take your thumbs and really wiggle that seam so that it's really, really, really exactly at the edge there and finger press it. And you're going to do another line of tiny back stitches just encasing the seam. For those of us who are neurotic, do you think we could iron that? You could if you wanted to. This, okay. um, when I make these, I'm usually <laughs> sewing al fresco. Yeah. Like uh -huh. I have them in my purse and I'm at the park or whatever. <laughs> sewing al fresco is the best term for that. It's, it's what it is. It's plein air sewing. Yeah. Um, but so I never have an iron with me when I'm doing these, but yes, you totally could. But linen is wonderful because it will finger press. Um, if you are doing wool, I should point out, you do not have to encase the edges. You just have to turn it um, like wrong sides or right sides together, right sides uh -huh. together like you normally would. Do one um, one seam of little back stitches. And then if you want to, you can fell down the seam allowances so that they don't get caught on your thumb because this is right. a very high traffic part. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to encase the edges. You don't have to finish the edges like at all. On but the, you can if you want to. And if you want to, but you don't have to. Okay, perfect. But if you're using linen, encase that stuff. Yeah, you need if to. you're using silk, you must. <laughs> you must. Or else that will be um, a, a single use apart. pair of mitts. Yeah, they will fall apart. <laughs> yeah. And we don't want single serving mitts because we are environmentally conscious. Plus, if you're going to spend five, six hours making something. Yeah. You want to get Or if you're me 10, because I'm slow. <laughs> so, so sore. My first pair of mitts that I made um, were so wonky and crooked. I had to cut the points off. Uh-huh because they were just so like, instead of being here, they were like here. 
<laughs> I'm glad my first pair of mitts is your kit. <laughs> yeah, that is that is after many, many um, prototypes yeah. and lots of development. All right, so you're finishing off there I'm with a bunch of whip stitches. Whip stitches, and then I'm going to tie a knot, and I'm going to bury my thread, which is a thing that I learned. All right, after I worked in Williamsburg, I came back to Pittsburgh, and I worked at Carnegie Mellon. And the man who was in charge of the shop when I was at Carnegie Mellon was a Hong Kong couturier. And he insisted that we do finishing techniques on everything. Yep. As frustrating as that was to learn, now I know and I can make things beautiful. So you tie your tiny knot and then you bury the end of your thread. You stick it through, through like you take a, a very long stitch and then you cut it off. Cut it so that there's no hanging thread and there's no way that that knot's going to come out. And that thread like wiggles back inside the seam and then it's gone forever, people. It's great. All right. So now I have a thumb and this That's is all thumb. finished. You want to put it on and give yourself a thumbs up. Woo, you get... Thumbs up. Okay. That's the first little easy bit. Okay. okay. So thumbs, hems, basting. So we're going to do hems now. So pick your mitt. Um, I'm going to make... Because I'm right-handed, I'm going to make a left-handed mitt. So this is the right-handed mitt. And honestly, the, um, there if if your fabric doesn't have a right side, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Wait, was that the right mitt? No, OK, this is the left mitt. OK, so I have You want to show mitt. us how to tell? Um, I, I lay my hand like this. And wherever my hand ends up is where. The thumb hole needs to be there. The thumb hole needs to be there. So yeah, OK. This is my fingers. And then this, cool. is, this is my left hand. Okay, so I'm going to take it and I'm going to do the bottom and it's the exact same as the thumb one. So this is a long seam if you want to do questions. Okay, so we're doing the same crazy rolled hem thing. Rolled thing. So finger press. I like to, I just like finger press the whole thing and then I'm going to roll it. Excellent. All right. What's the first concert you ever went to? <laughs> first concert I went to see um, Chicago. Yes. Dad at a rib fest when I was like seven. That's amazing. Mine, mine was Beach Boys. I've seen the Beach Boys like 27 times or something. I live in Southern California at the time. So that would be amazing. We saw them on Virginia Beach when I was maybe like, it was the same trip where we went to Williamsburg because we went to Williamsburg and then my dad was like, I need to go to the beach. So we went to Virginia Beach. That's cool. And he swears he saw Brian Wilson riding a bike on the boardwalk, but I think he was making it up. Out on the boardwalk. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you were a candy bar, what candy bar would you be and why? Oh gosh, something with caramel. Yeah. Caramel so much. Either a Milky Way or a hundred grand. I oh, feel like 100 a hundred grand are so good. Like very underrated Halloween candy because it's a crunch yeah. bar with caramel in the middle. Yeah. I'm a purist. Um, I, I started out liking Caramello, but then in Australia, they have these um, uh, Cadbury bears that ha are just a chocolate bear with a big old glob of, of liquidy gooey caramel inside. And they are the best thing. And the, the greatest thing about them is you can just bite the little bear head off. <laughs> so if you're having an aggressive day, you can take it out and get chocolate at the same time. That's, that sounds amazing. I think I need that in my life. Yeah. All right. What is the weirdest job you've ever had? The weirdest job. I mean, I've done weird things at my job. Let me see. That sound was my neck. <laughs> um, weirdest job. I worked for um, a, an, an Eastern European dance troupe as a seamstress. All of my jobs have been either teaching or sewing or teaching. Okay. Um, I mean, sewing's kind of a weird job, a little it, bit. It is. I. It shouldn't be, but it kind of is. Yeah, it's unusual when people, yeah. when people ask, you know, what it is you do. I don't. I never tell them I sew. I say I'm a historical costumer because the historical part throws them, and yeah. then they ask me to alter stuff for them. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So I worked for. Um. They're called the uh, Duquesne Tamboritsons. And they're an internationally recognized, like really high quality Eastern European dance troupe. And they do this like camp, rehearsal camp every summer to get prepared for their show where for like two weeks, they all go live at this private boarding school that's off for the summer. But it's just a whole bunch of like Romanians and Bulgarians and Lithuanians. Just oh, that's awesome. Super blasted every night. And as a <laughs> I was invited and then like, 
<laughs> would have to somehow find my way back to my little like dorm room and then wake up at 7 a.m. to make it to breakfast. That's amazing. You're going to run out of thread there, girl. I am. I'm going to make a knot after. Oh, I OK. <laughs> um, that's amazing. I like um, historical fabric mage. That's um, makes it very magical. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it also like confuses the heck out of people and they just go, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> My second line of that is always it's unusual. I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. I, um, I, I think it's awesome. I think it's really awesome. I enjoy I'm, it. I'm pleased that there are people in the world who've done nothing but get to sew because that's that's cool. It's fun. It, yes. Yes. Well, I did take a break where I was a nanny for a couple of years. But yeah, yeah. It's same as same as mom, sort of. That's true. Well, um, yeah, yeah. I was just a mom for like extra children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bonus. I, I'm a mom for cats. That, that right. is an, a, a, a formidable job as well. Seven, seven cats. Yeah. I, I equate seven cats to one quarter of a human child. I, I'd say that's pretty fair. Yeah. Cause like they all need attention in sequential order, basically anytime I'm in the house <laughs> and they scream and cry. And, and when you don't feed them at the t exact time that they want to be fed, they swarm. So you have this like little <laughs> hurricane of cats going around you and you're like, I can't walk. This is crazy. They know how to get you to do what they want. That's amazing. Honestly, they are in charge around here and we are just servants. <laughs> well, that's the way it works with cats. Yeah. But seven is kind of crazy. Seven's a lot of cats. Yeah. All right. If peanut butter wasn't called peanut butter, what would it be called? Oh, what would it be called? All I can think is in Germany, they called Erdnuss cream. Yep. Which is, which is just fun to say. Um, what would it be called? Bean spread. Bean spread. All right. Bean if someone told me in, I think it was, was it Dutch? Someone sent me a message saying that it's um, in their language, it's peanut cheese. Peanut cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's amazing. I love it. That's fantastic. Right? <laughs> um, when I was in college, we went, um, I went to Germany and we visited um, my roommate from college's had hosted an exchange student when she was in high school. And so we went to visit him um, and we stayed with his family and his mother was just the sweetest lady, just wanted to accommodate us. And she was like, and the Americans are coming. And so she bought a little thing of peanut butter, but she didn't know how to like cook with it or eat it. Cause they, they have spreadable cheese. Why would they need peanut butter? Like quark is a thing. You don't need peanut butter if you have like good cheese um so she would just like put it on the table at every meal in the hopes that one of us would use it for something and she would figure out what it was for that's amazing so it would be like fish cakes and like <laughs> and peanut butter <laughs> just right there <laughs> uh someone says it's dutch and i i do believe that i have a, a lot of dutch viewers believe it or not uh next time i go to amsterdam or anywhere else in the netherlands i'm going yeah. to have a massive meet and greet i think <laughs> um okay the next question if i was ready for it would be what is your favorite flavor and that can be any flavor favorite flavor goodness right okay i think i have two okay and it's temperature dependent though that's cool um, Choc like milk chocolate which is kind of a cop-out but milk chocolate and then hot earl gray tea yeah okay it has Great. To be hot. if it's cold it's no good right i agree with that 100 percent. what's your favorite flavor uh umame <laughs> oh i didn't even think of that but that's a good like one. steak <laughs> mm -hmm. just it's not even steak it's just that like very satisfying Mm, that you get from savory food mm -hmm. yeah um I crave that I'm, I'm I don't know are you more of a sweet person or a salty person with snacky stuff um I am a salty person for sure um I I used to have a big sweet tooth but now I don't so yeah um I I eat vegetarian 50% of the time so I eat two meals a day and one of them is always vegetarian but because of you know we're locked in the house one one week for like five days I went vegetarian accidentally just because that's what we were eating mm -hmm. and then on that fifth day like I had a dream about a cheeseburger oh like 
I was freaking out and I was like, I need meat. And my husband was like, oh, okay. So we went to In-N-Out and it was honestly the best burger I've ever had. Like, <laughs> I was just like, yes, there's nothing. I could never be a full-time veg. I mean, I, I can do it pretty regularly and I do do it pretty regularly, but I could never, I like, it's, it's my jam. All right. What's going on there? There's some I'm mystery. I'm making it hot, but I have messed it up somehow. So I'm going to like boil it down. So you're just doing the bottom hem edge just so yeah. everyone's clear, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. What do you think about garden gnomes? Um, I'm fairly certain I don't have any because I feel like my garden would be in better shape if I had some. Okay. Um, are you talking about like the, um, the sculptures or the actual creatures? Let's say both. Okay. The sculptures, I feel like it can be cute, but can also be incredibly ugly. Yep. <laughs> um, depending on your taste. I remember watching David the Gnome when I was a kid and being wholly terrified. <laughs> so I feel like that might color my opinion on garden gnomes, but <laughs> I've always had a soft spot for like fantastical mystical creatures and like their existence. And I'm yep. certain they're somewhere or yeah. maybe at some point in history or, you know, in time. That's cool. Possibly. I, I think they're cute. Yeah. I think it can be. I just like, I never got over being terrorized by David the Gnome. Did you? Okay. The very last one, there's like a ritual suicide that happened. Oh my God. Wow. Like David and his wife decide they've lived long enough. And so they just lay down and die. Yikes. <laughs> and that's the end of the series. And that really like disturbed me as a six year old. So. <laughs> I'm like, that reminds me of Nicholas Flamel from Harry Potter. Oh, and yeah. then. I'm done. I'm and then out. I have a a a mind blowing fact for everyone. Go. No. Today is Harry Potter fortieth birthday. Oh my gosh, that's right. He, Harry Potter is forty years old today. Not not the book, but Harry Potter himself. You know what brings me wonderful comfort is that no matter how old I get, I'm always younger than Harry Potter. <laughs> I'm two years older than Harry Potter. Well, there you go. Yeah. He could be your little brother. He could be. Uh, okay. If you had a choice between two superpowers, being invisible or flying, which would you choose oh, and why? What? Flying, hands down. Why? Because then I could get places and I wouldn't have to drive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 100%. <laughs> yeah. All right. That one was easy. Um, <laughs> I've thought about that one before. <laughs> what is the last gift you gave someone? last gift I sent um a um an embroidered fichu to my friend Kendall who runs um beginning um the beginner's guide to the 18th century oh she, yeah um has done an awful lot for me and is just a lovely lovely person and lovely people deserve pretty things and so I sent her a pretty little kerchief that's that's awesome Oh, sweet. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh my gosh. Okay. So when I was little, I was fully obsessed with ballerinas. Mm -hmm. And, but my dad was, um, he worked in hospitals and he was like, well, you should be a doctor. Um, and so I was like humoring him. I was like, well, I'll totally be a doctor, but I want to be a ballerina doctor. And I didn't mean like an orthopedic doctor that like works on ballerinas. Uh -huh. I'm a doctor that also wore a tutu and point shoes. And the most important part of this was the outfit. I would absolutely go to that doctor. I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> yeah. Like, could, is it okay for adults to go to this doctor? Because I'm in. And they, because I would love that doctor as well. And, and actually, this doctor exists and is a girl that I used to dance with when I was younger. Oh my God. She's That's now amazing. She's now in New York City. That's amazing. Yes. I, I want to know if I can go to this doctor in a tutu. I mean, I feel like that would be kind of like required, wouldn't it? I mean, I I would be down to do that. I mean, it would suck <laughs> if you had some like wound though. So yeah, maybe. I think in my head, the ballerina doctor was also a pediatrician. Yeah. Because that makes the most sense, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If you're going to be a doctor, it makes sense that you'd be working with children. 
Uh, we are halfway through 20 questions. So I'm going to stop and ask you to talk to us a little bit about your store and how Etsy works and how you're finding Etsy and all the things about Etsy. I could tell you lots of things about Etsy. Yeah, I bet you can. <laughs> I could. Um, it, all right. I will start, I will start by saying that it is an amazing platform as a beginner who knows nothing about making a website or running a business or, um, anything like that, which I did not when I started my business, I still don't know very much. I mean, I don't know about web design. I don't know about that kind of thing. Um, however, as the years have progressed and it has not been that many years, I've only been in business since November of 2017. So we're coming up on, it's only been like two and a half, three, not even three years yet. Um, in that time, they have raised their rates um, a lot and they keep implementing these new policies that take money away from sellers and give it to themselves for like providing services that we didn't ask for that you can't opt out of, which is really frustrating because I don't mark things up very high to begin with. And makers in general don't charge what they're worth. And I feel like they're definitely taking advantage of that. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. If you are a maker and you want to just like find people to buy your things, Etsy's fantastic. If you're making it a career, you have a second outlet, which is what I'm working on right now. Um, I'm going to, while you're finishing this up, share my screen. And hopefully it will switch to my screen for people who want this information, which people might want this information. I'm, I'm showing them the badge code. I have been getting such a kick out of people that are like, so I was a Girl Scout. I'm collecting all the badges. Yeah. Yeah. I will show this again later. So don't worry. But I thought I would take this moment to show you that. And now I'm going to go back to Jess. Okay. I have just finished the hem. I'm going to knot it and snip my thread. And take a sip of tea because I've been talking. It's Earl Grey, but it's no longer as hot as I want it to be. <laughs> I literally have three glasses of water and a cup of tea here. You need to stay hydrated. It's important. As I'm doing two lives a day that are two hours each. So oh like, gosh, yeah, you, you got to drink. That's why I'm drinking through all of them. Go on vocal rest after this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will. So I have just taken my little scissors and in this little corner right here, I have made a teeny diagonal snip. How, how long? Like quarter of an inch. Okay. Diagonal, diagonal towards the point here. So like this way. And right. now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold back my seam allowance. This technique of folding in your seam allowance and then attaching on top is a very 18th century technique. Um, this is if you've ever made like an Italian gown or a waistcoat or basically anything that has a lining. This is yep. basically how you do it. You fold back your seam allowance and then you put the other thing on top of it. Yep. So, um, I've done this over a hundred times, so I did it very quickly. However, this point right here, the curvy bit is tricky. Um, the way Should that you I clip do, it, you know, actually I, I don't, I guess you could, I don't though, because I always, because if you do it too close, then you have these yeah. like, threads that stick up. Yeah. And honestly, you can just mush it and it's fine. <laughs> okay. So I fold it to the end of the straight part. And then I let that bit go and I pull the next bit down. So I'm not making it lay flat. I'm taking it like a teeny bit at a time. So do you see right. how I'm doing that? Yeah. And as you're, as you're basting it, you're going to do the same thing. So the next step is to baste. So with a running stitch, I'm, I'm doing maybe like four stitches to an inch here with the running stitch. And I'm not tying a knot. I leave like an inch, inch or two tail so okay. that I can pull it out at the end. I'm going to baste this. Basting is key in all sewing, people. All sewing. It's wonderful. It seems like a giant waste of time, and it is absolutely not. It's going to save you a lot of yeah. thing in the yeah. end. So it, basically, if you, if you don't baste, you're going to spend twice the time you would have basted seam ripping. Yeah. Okay. So I have a little bump. I'm going to go into my bump, yep. and then my next stitch is on the other side of that bump. Yep. And then... 
Just become one with the bump and accept it. Bump, let it be. You're going to smoosh it with your fingers. It'll be fine. How, how much is your seam allowance? Is it a quarter inch, half an inch? This is closer to a half an inch. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. But you can make this as fiddly as you want to. All you have to do is match it with the other. Exactly. Yeah. Piece. So exactly. as long as you do them the same, it's fine. And then I'm basting it. I usually sing the I'm basting song, which is like, I'm basting, I'm basting. And I just sing the I'm basting song the whole time. I'm, I'm ridiculous when I sew. I, I, you just heard me singing. Yeah. <laughs> I do the exact same thing. Okay. Yep. Once you have it basted, it's actually much easier to tell which of your points is which. Oh, yeah. One of them has a slightly longer side mm -hmm. and a blunted blunted corner that's yep. the outside and that's you can see like that fits better than this one right so now i'm gonna just turn this over and do the same and do the same all right i'm gonna throw another question at you so what is something that we would not expect about you um when i was in high school i had purple hair oh wow would you consider having purple hair again I don't know. Like I, why or why not? I, uh, dying hair turns into more of a commitment than I ever yeah. commit to my hair. <laughs> yeah. Cause it has to be maintained. And like ugh, the thing with the purple hair is it looked good for like a day and then it looked like crap for like three weeks. The second yeah. you wash it, it's, it it, was, the effect is now muted yeah. literally. So Eh, it's if you want to maintain it and you do then it can absolutely look amazing but I know that I do not have the patience or the commitment to do that yeah are you capable of sewing slightly farther away from your camera uh-huh yeah my, it's terrible and I apologize so no I no worries in my face I am like that too I, I sew like six inches. Man, when I come out of that, you heard my neck cracking earlier. Yeah. And when I sew, I sit cross-legged on my bed and sew because that is actually the most comfortable place for me. And I stick a pillow on my lap and sew on that. And like- That's, good. Pin... that's, a, Taylor's, that's a Taylor's pose. Yeah. And I, I pin to my ham and stuff, but because I sit yeah. cross-legged and looking down and I don't stop for like hours, I get out and I'm like, crack, creak, creak, <laughs> creak, crack. <laughs> okay. Um... Where are we? Here we go. A penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and why is he here? <laughs> what? A penguin, or if you're Benedict Cumberbatch, penguin. I can't even say it like he does. It's so funny. Um, a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and no, why is he here? An anthropomorphic penguin because why is he yeah. walking through the door? Well, I mean, how else would you get a penguin in a sombrero? Exactly. <laughs> well, obviously he says something in Spanish. I think he's going to say hola hombres because okay. I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> why is he here? I don't yeah. know. Now I'm picturing the penguins from Madagascar. I'm sure he needs help with some sort of dastardly plot. All right. He does not care about this mitt class at all. He just no, wants, he wants to distract me like my children do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fun, fun story. I've been to Antarctica. I've been to all seven continents oh. and I have had penguins come sit in my lap. That's awesome. Oh, you were oh. telling me you had penguin poop in a pocket once. Uh-huh. Yep. And also... Um, penguins are stinky mofos. <laughs> like you have no idea. Well, like we would... are, but I guess, I mean, they, they eat fish, which means that they smell and, like fish. And they just like the whole continent smells like penguin poop. So right. like we would get back on the boat yeah. and everyone would just be like, oh, it smells like Gen 2 up in here. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. All right. What's going on there? Okay. Now we are going to take our pins we're going to match our points together. Um, if they're not exact, that's fine. Just make it work. When you get to like a point, like I can see this is overhanging a teeny bit right here. When I get there, I'll take the basting out and just kind of like wiggle it back down, back under. Um, 
So you want this to be slightly to the inside. So you want there to be an edge. And this is again, an 18th century thing. Like you never sew, you never sew things like edge to edge. You always offset it a teeny bit. Yeah, it's prettier that way. Get a little, it's like piping, but not. Yeah. It's just like, so your lining doesn't peek out unintentionally. So I like to to match my point point first and then go down the flats of the sides. Mm -hmm. And like that. What, is this your preferred pin? These are quilters pins, yeah? Yes, I like these. These are my favorites um, okay. because I can find them when I drop them on my floor. Yep. I I like them, but also I iron them until that little yellow thing is a weird flat blob. <laughs> That's the only thing about them. You can't like, you're not, well, I guess you can't really iron them. Um, yeah, you can. I do it all the time. <laughs> well, if they were glass headed, they wouldn't melt, but they'd also be a lot more expensive. I, yeah, I use glass-headed ones. Actually, glass-headed ones are really cheap on eBay. Really? Oh, sorry, not eBay, Amazon. I've got like, I got a pack of like 10 cases, or, like 10, 10 boxes of pins for like $8. What? Yeah, all glass-headed. So that's, I switched to that. Okay. And because I have 10 of, 10 of them, I don't care about them anymore. I just <laughs> let them die if they die. My, um, my former boss who used to work in Hong Kong said that the stitchers in the costume shop where he worked were given 150 pins at the end of the beginning of the term. And Mm -hmm. then at the end of the term, they turned in their 150 pins. Holy cow. What if they're like bent or broken or lost? They still, they give them back, but they keep them. Wow. Okay. What's going on now? Okay. We're going to start sewing. So we're going to use, um, I guess it's a slip stitch. I call it an app. An applique stitch because a slip stitch to me takes even stitches from front and back but we're just going to take i'll show you all right i'm going to move this a little bit closer to the camera because we're going to do stitching i start about this is eh, three eighths half of an inch up because this is going to get tucked under oh okay i was like what are you doing you want yeah you want this corner to be free okay and i'm going to take a little a little tiny like this is i think it's like four or five threads stitch here and then I'm going to catch the very edge of my lining, like the very uh, Okay. And that's the stitch I'm going to do. So yep. pick up a couple of threads behind just the very edge. When I bind a corset, this is how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. This is, um, it's a, it's a good binding stitch. I'm not actually sure. I call it applique stitch. I think this might be, um, the Ponta Rabacha or whatever. I don't speak mm-hmm. French. I can't really do that, but. Um, I think in the American Duchess book, um, Lauren and Abby call it the um, inverted hem stitch Mm -hmm. because you take a longer stitch behind and a really tiny stitch in front. Stitch names are a funny, funny thing because like people don't necessarily agree on what they call stuff, but everyone knows what you're talking about and is down for whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's, It's one of the very few, like sewing is one of the very few sports where like you can use whatever terminology you want. And as long as people understand what you're talking about, it's all good. Yeah. yeah. I can remember going from, cause I've worked in four or five different costume shops, like between the colleges and the jobs and stuff like that. And um, the terminology differs from shop to shop. And having to learn that every time we go, it's like learning a different programming language. It's um, like, I know exactly what they want me to do, but you're going to have to show me as well as tell me because I don't, what, what are you saying to me? Because like, yeah, yeah. It's like a different language. I am a show me person. Oh, definitely. Me too. Very yeah. visual. Yeah. Actually, I kind of want to like, I, I, I want to see it and then I want to do it mm-hmm. for sure. I'll remember it. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is going to take a minute. So ask me more if you have more. If you could trade places with any other person for one week, famous or not, living or dead, real or fictional, whom would it be? Oh, gosh. Whom would it be? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't even know if that's correct. I have no idea. Who would I pick? I don't know. I would have said Felicity a couple of weeks ago, but now I feel like that's problematic. (laughs) I, you know, I think it's, uh, I've come to this place with it where I think we should spend our energy not worrying too much about that stuff and more worrying. I mean, it's important to worry about it, but like more worried about the stuff we need to change right now, like, you know, police reform and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And and come back to the the, this stuff a little bit later, but I also think it's okay to enjoy things like 
I, someone people were having a Harry Potter discussion in the comments and I'm I'm definitely a person who's like this story is now ours and not hers and so I'm not going to worry about what she thinks anymore I don't pay attention to her um but you know I think it's okay to enjoy it so okay. if you want if you want to be Felicity I think that's cool I would be Felicity but I would be a more socially conscious Felicity <laughs> all right that's fair and that's the thing like i looking at the past and the things that have been done in the past is important to be aware of, but we can't affect that. Yeah. Yeah, we exactly. Forward, so, and in my discussions with, with POC folks, um, I have discovered that that is exactly how the, all the people I've spoken to personally feel about it as well. Okay. So um, be Felicity, but I could be a secret abolitionist. Yeah. Maybe she has an agenda you never knew about in the books. You never knew. She grows into it after the books stop. I have a, a controversial answer to this question, which is I would be Donald Trump and I would quit. <laughs> I mean, that would be amazing. Right? <laughs> that would be, um, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of people who wouldn't love it, but <laughs> I, I, that's what I would do. <laughs> um, nice. Okay. If someone wrote a biography about you, what do you think the title would be? Just keep sewing. Just keep sewing. Are you both like Dory and a stitcher? Uh-huh. Okay, perfect. That's awesome. <laughs> Very much so. I think mine would be, where even am I? <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> What's even happening? Uh, I travel a lot. So sometimes I wake up and I'm like, where even am I? <laughs> like I, when I was in South America, I took this crazy trip when we went to Antarctica. Cause you go to Antarctica for like 12 days, but you got to leave from Tierra del Fuego. So okay. if you're going to go all the way down there. You might as well hang out. So we went to Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and Bolivia and went to the Atacama desert and stuff. We went all over Argentina too. It was really cool. But every, my husband planned most of it. I planned all the city stuff and he planned all of the rural parts, which was like, you know, two or three weeks of it I didn't know where we were going I didn't even ask I was just like just take me wherever we're going I'll get on the plane we had like 11 flights it was crazy so um and it was six weeks long and every morning I would wake up and I'd be like where even am I and he'd be like oh we're in blah 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 and I'd be like oh what's here and he's like there's glaciers here and I'm like uh we're in a desert and he's like yep (laughs) (laughs) Argentina and and like South America honestly is one of the coolest places I think people just dismiss it and don't even think about it honestly it's awesome like I would go back in a heartbeat I would live in Chile no problem it's exactly like California but upside down basically like it it's oh man I can't even say enough about South America like all of the places down there that I went to were awesome I visited another exchange student in um, Ecuador right oh, after cool. I graduated from high school. She lived in Quito and she took, oh. she took us to the beach. She took us to yeah. the jungle. She took us like, the only thing we didn't do was the Galapagos. Cause that was like, we'd have to charter a flight. Yeah. Um, but I remember we got off of a bus and like in the dark, we're looking for a hotel and we found a place for like $2 a night and we woke up and we were like at the foot of like an active volcano. And I was yeah. like, I don't even know how we got here. Uh, South America is insane. It's so funny how people just don't even think about it as like an option. I, I want to go back. Like I, people who go to South America and don't come back, I get what happened. Get like yeah. they were just like, yes, and stayed. This yeah. Is what I'm now. <laughs> um, Okay. If the animal kingdom were to elect a new monarch, which animal would you vote for and why? A butterfly. A butterfly. That's amazing. That's like the best answer. Okay. Why? Because they know how to change. Oh, I love that answer. You win that answer. answer Because you said monarch and there's a monarch butterfly. (laughs) (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. You're having the problem we all have right now. I know my thread is knotted. I gotta like fix it. It happens, people, it even when it's that. waxed. Okay, uh, question for you. Do you iron your wax thread? Nope. Do you have any like thoughts on that? It's all the way over there. I'm not getting up. <laughs> sure, but do you think it's better to iron it or do you, does it even matter to you? Eh, I mean, I'm sure that there's a school of thought that yes, it is better. And if you're doing something super technical where you need your thread to be extra, super strong, like millinery or furry furry ring yeah or coats or something then yes but for regular sewing I don't think it's necessary so I like it when it's iron because it's less grabby yeah that is true. and and it's more smooth and um I I do do millinery so 
that is useful yeah. for me. Yeah. But yeah. So I need to point out that I have ended the part where um, the folded bit is, and I'm actually going to stitch a few stitches beyond that. Okay. Um, How big are your stitches? What is your- They're your... teeny. On this part, they're teeny. Let me grab my measuring tape. Okay. Uh, time check is one hour in, just so you know. We are one hour in. Okay. Let's you see. You feeling good about that? Yep. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Wow. Okay. I meant like eight. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so cool. This is just um, because I've done this so often, I'm, I'm used to making them teeny. When I yep. teach people how to sew for the first time, I always tell them to make your stitches as big as they need to be so you learn the motion. Just mm -hmm. make it even. Because you can always make it smaller once you get like more practiced at it. Right. So you want them to be even. Okay. So, so, now, so this would be a good place to take the iron and just smash it right, right on that. Yeah, just like, just do it. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now this bit, because I still have my thread and it's over here. This only works on the left hand. On the right hand, you have to cut it because it's on the other side. Oh, could you start with it instead? Potentially, yeah. Okay. I've never, I honestly never thought of that because the order in my head is, is the opposite. Right. Um, you can, I guess, because it's a corner, you can choose to either do this hem or you can choose to turn under the point and hem right. that. So that thing you're doing right now is the hem of the part that goes over your palm. Yes, this is the hem of the palm. Bit. Okay. All right, perfect. I'm going to ladder stitch that. All right, question number 16 out of 20. So, oh. If you were arrested with no explanation, what would your friends and family assume you had done? I have no idea. I rarely leave my house. I would probably be like, <laughs> protesting something yeah I think my family would probably think that I I was like chained to a bulldozer somewhere and yeah, got arrested like that. yeah even when I was in high school I used to go out and like do protesting stuff um yeah now I now I protest on my Instagram account <laughs> constantly ah uh, that's still magic just just so we're all clear let's see what's going on in the comments um commenters if you guys have any questions you can like, feel free to throw them in there. And if I see them, then I will do them. I will do them. Um, for those of you who haven't seen Sumner Geeks, um, watch Sumner Geeks, S-U-M-N-E-R Geeks on, let's look it up on YouTube. Um, it's a D&D &D group of people who are like, it's a cartoon of a people, bunch of people who are D&D &D characters, but they're playing D&D &D and they're acting like you know, cliche D and D people. And so one of the guys is like, if there are girls there, I want to do them. So anytime I say the words, do them, I immediately go back to that in my head and it makes me <laughs> giggle. Okay. Um, next question. If you ran away and joined the circus, mm -hmm. what would your performance be? Oh, I'd probably be like a tightrope walker, a trapeze artist. Ah, I could totally see that. Once again, because of the costume. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to take a little break from 20 questions and ask you other things. Um, we decided we were going to talk about public versus private life within costuming a little bit. Yes. Thoughts. Thoughts. Um, I, when I first started my account, I thought that I needed to be everything if that makes sense like I had to fully devote to building a brand and making you know beautiful amazing costumes so that people would see me and then I would gain some traction especially because it was attached to a business um and after about a full year of that I was completely burnt out and what I really, really wanted was just some time that was like just for me where I didn't have to tell people what I was doing every single moment of every day. Yeah. And I could have my own personal projects that were for me. Like I didn't have to share them. I didn't have to think about, you know, I want to, I want to make myself a pair of shorts, but that's not going to look good on Instagram. So I'm not going to do it. Or, right. You know, something like that. And so they're definitely like in everything there's a balance that needs to be struck and the balance is always something that needs tweaking and it needs attention and it needs finding. Yeah. 
For um, sure. I mean, especially like, not only am I a customer, I'm also a parent. I'm also a business owner. I'm also a spouse. I'm also, you know, a lot of different things to different people and they all need not equal, but equitable attention. So you did not sync that thread. I didn't because it's the very edge and we're going to cut it off. Oh, okay. Never mind. Um, all right. So since I didn't do this part, I'm now going to trim that a teeny bit, teeny bit there. Did everyone see how I did that? I guess. Just, just nip off the corners. Nip it off. And then I'm going to fold it under a teeny bit and that's so that it doesn't pop out and then under a teeny bit. And it's probably better to save that until after you've done this because you want it to be even-ish. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to pin that down. And then this just gets a really tiny hem stitch. Like you want to take maybe one thread from the body fabric. Because you will see it on the other side. On the other side. So you want it to be super tiny. And especially since I'm using a contrasting thread, I'm going to try to be super tiny with it. Yeah. So. Um, so on your other ones that you're sitting there right next to you, those beautiful silk ones. Yeah. So you have some embroidery on there. You do that before you do anything else, right? I do that actually, once I have my thumb set, I do the embroidery. I just do it. It's oh. like my second to last step. Okay. Because, um, when you, mm, I guess if you wanted to embroider this part of it here, mm -hmm. I would do it before you put this on it, like this put on it. Mm -hmm. But when I when I embroider, I usually only embroider from knuckles down. Right. So um, then I know where to position it. All right. People in the comments are saying that the coupon code is not yet working. Is it not active yet? It should be. Um, I'm. It might not. Uh, it should be. We'll check um, it after. Yeah, we'll Let's check it after. If it's not working, I, I'll check. It. it should be thumbs up co co 20. I may have posted it as 19 because I forgot it was 2020. It does say 19. So I'll change okay. it. So it's 20. Well, that, that'll clarify. Okay. Um, people are asking if this video will be up forever. This video will remain up on my channel for as long as Jess says it's cool. If she ever tells me to take it down, I will take it down. Otherwise it's yours for the taking. So yes, you can go order those mitt kits or make whatever you want out of whatever pattern you want and come back and watch this again. People are asking what we play and do you play D and D at all, Jess? I don't. Um, my husband, um, plays video games, but he plays dark souls. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that at all. Yeah, sure. He, they have, there's a board game version of dark souls. That's much simplified from D and D there's no real character development, but it's similar in the, um, turn-based and like the actions and the stuff like that. Um, and he and his friend spent almost a year in like their free fun dork out time adapting it and turning it into just a really interesting kind of game. Um, and <laughs> we've been playing it um, online um, with uh, Roll20 since the um, pandemic started. Yeah. I say we've been playing it. I'm allowed to watch, but the <laughs> I was I, he let me play. I completely like there were six of us playing and so it's turn-based and so after everyone's turn like the the enemy got to go and so by the time it got back to me it had been like 20 minutes and I was just gone like I don't have that attention span so I was sitting there sewing and then I would miss my turn and then I would like apparently I was supposed to be the healer and it got down to like the knight got killed and so it was just me and like the mage and I ran away because I wanted to stay alive and so everyone else died because I was the healer and so <laughs> I've been banned from playing oh that's cool <laughs> because I'm not good at it so I'm allowed to watch. Um, I do play in D and D. I haven't played in a really long time. I also play. Uh, what is that called? It'll come back to me later. Crap. It, it's a it's a D and D like game, but I play it in the card version. So I have to think about that. Um, I haven't played that in a couple of years either because we had a uh, health emergency in my friend's family, and then we had um, a pandemic. Um, but yeah, I do play D and D. I frequently play mages. I mean, those are the most fun. And also you get to stand back. Sometimes I'll play, um, a, like a ranged fighter. 
um, like a archer sort of I'm type always deal archery. or like a druid? If I had a weapon, like if I lived in a, a fantasy world where I had to carry a weapon, I would definitely carry um, a bow and arrow. I would be an archer. Oh yeah. Um, I would, I would have both a bow and arrow and a crossbow. Cause like, you never know when you need to have a short range, just get it done kind of weapon. I'd have a dagger in my boot. My friend brought me over this kit and it's like one of those 40 gallon giant tubs you get at target, uh-huh. um, full of, of things to have in case of the zombie apocalypse. And I'm oh like, God. where's the crossbow? <laughs> All right. So you cut this hole out. Now I'm cutting out my thumb bean. Your thumb bean. I love it. Mm-hmm. Okay. On the pattern, I should point out that if you are using a, um, an extant pattern, like a, an extant um, transcribed pattern, like from um, Costume Close-Up or um, the one that's in the American Duchess Guide, um, the, they show it at the actual size. I have found, and this is me in my, I've done this a hundred sometimes, you have to start smaller and then increase the size. Because if okay, you why? Too big, there's no going back. Right. And you just have a giant gaping hole. Okay. So you want to make it as small as you can to begin with, and then you're going to sew it on. So I have it here. My stitch line is actually going to be like here. Whoa. I'm going to cut the whole thing away. Wow. That's really much bigger. Yeah. All right. It's going to be a lot bigger. So, all right. So here's how you do thumbs. And this is the trickiest part. Are you ready? Yep. All right. Number one, you give your hand a cape. You give your hand a cape. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to point out here is also most patterns, if they tell you to draft or if you're looking at an extant, so here's the back of it. They're going to position the thumb hole. Where'd my thumb bean go? I want to show you. Never mind. All right. I don't know where it is. They're going to position it so that the center of it is here. I'll show you like this. Yeah. On mine, that's not where the center is. Right. Because on your hand, your thumb sits further towards your palm. This is the natural state of your hand. It's not this. This is flexed. This is relaxed. So you right. want to actually keep it so that your um, thumb hole is more towards the palm of your hand. Or when you relax your hand, you're going to twist the back of the mitt. Right. So that's the thing that I've noticed. It's some. It's like three fifths is about where I say that it is. So it's like three fifths over more towards the palm if you're driving. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So hand cape. I've got my little inset insert here should be over the webbing of your thumb. Mm-hmm. And then you take your, th- your thumb turned so that it's right side out and you put it on so that the seam matches that little notch and then smooth it out. Yes, I realize that this is raw edge. We're not stopping. This isn't our final step. We're not stopping. We're not stopping. All right. It's like my mom on road trips. We're not stopping. Um, so now you want to put your pins in carefully on, so your, you, on your hand, on your hand. This is why I did my left hand. Cause I'm right-handed like a boss. So how, what happens when you have to do the other hand? It's just awkward. It's like painting your nails. Yeah. Okay. You'll get better at it. You'll get better at it. And this isn't, this isn't permanent. This is just so that it stays in place when you take it off. So it doesn't have to be too many. I only put in three and that's probably going to be enough. So now I'm going to pull it off. Here's the tricky part that I don't have in my um, instructions, but I probably should is that you need to set this over a curved surface. And this is another thing that I learned from my Hong Kong Couturier guy is that when, and can you see, I have my knee up here. I'm gonna move this slightly so you can see my knee. Um, I use my knee because it's, I don't, I won't lose it, which is honestly the reason I breastfed my children because I couldn't lose their food. (laughs) All right, if you can move your camera up slightly. A bit, sorry, all right. Okay, we good? Yeah, that looks better. All right, so I have it. I have it over my knee. The reason you do this is because your hand is not a flat surface; it's a curved surface. So if you were to if you were to set it on a flat surface and then you put it over a curve, it's gonna pucker. This is the same thing. If you're putting like a lining into a bodice, you should actually pin it over a curved surface, not flat. People are freaking out. They're like, I'm holding my breath. I see this going so wrong. (laughs) I'm dropping knowledge bombs here. Okay. Um, I actually have, and this is something that I I picked up when I was at CMU. I have one of those like Christmas popcorn tins that I use to pin bodice linings, bodices and linings together, like flat lining. And you lay it over and then you put your pins in as it's on the curve. Oh yeah. You could use a ham too. 
You can, yes. Um, or a pillow. With a tailor's ham. My tailor's ham is somewhere in my room. And I'm not showing you my room because my room is a disaster. But this part's clean right here. So we're just going to stay here. Okay. So now we're going to fold under the seam allowance, which is about, what is that? Like meh, three eighths of an inch. Eyeball it. Eyeball it. You'll be fine. You'll be good. No fear, kids. <laughs> no fear. We're going to go for it. Start at the notch and you're going to go around the circle. Just try. Just do the thing, peeps. Do the thing. Um, this works amazingly well. I'm going to rank, I'm going to put pins in my mouth and talk, which is really unadvisable, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, this is the most difficult to the least difficult fabric wise. Silk taffeta is a bear when you try to do this because it doesn't want to curve. Um, linen somewhere in the middle, cotton's about even with linen and wool is so nice. It's like, oh, you want me to curve? Okay. Like wool is just the best. Wool is the most kind fabric. It's so forgiving. Okay. So I'm going to turn this under and okay. Here's another trick. Try to if, make a circle. <laughs> yeah. If you can't get linen to crease the way you want it to roll it like this. Yep. And then it'll be a little bit happier. All right. So that was a much bigger seam allowance there. Yeah. It's more like half an inch when you get to the bottom of the circle. Honestly, it can be as big or as small as you want. This is, um, this is just how the circle wants to go with me. Just make it pretty peeps. It'll make be fine. It as even as possible. I think in the instructions, it's like this part might not be. Yeah. <laughs> just try to make it even. It'll be okay. Trust the process people. It'll be fine. Yeah, and I, I'm trying really hard not to pin this to my skirt. That would be awkward. I I want to shout out right now. I'm wearing um, the dress that I made from Lauren from Wearing History's wrap dress pattern. Oh, that's awesome. It's super. I love her. It's she's just the sweetest lady. And she's um, so nice. I have I've made this dress twice so far and I have a third one that's cut out. That's I had to move my sewing machine for this, but it's, it's my next project. And, um, we were chatting about how we miss thrifting and she was like, oh man, I need to go get some sheets. And I was like, I have sheets. And so I ended up just like, my mom had just cleaned out all of her linens and she had all of my grandmother's old sheets from like the sixties. Oh, wow. And I sent them on to Lauren. Someone asks, is there any reason you don't turn the seam allowance before you p position it and start pinning? because it's going to be adjusted as you do this. I'm doing this on ah. in one because I've done this a hundred times, mm -hmm. but um, my first pair, it took some doing. And honestly, like I might go back and readjust this pin and I might fix that seam allowance. Do you, you try this on again before, after you pin? Um, no, well, I okay. could, but I, I don't, but you could. Um, I guess technically, if you wanted to, you could turn the seam allowance if you're making, and I've made leather mitts before where that's necessary because you have to like glue the seam allowance down and then like put it on. Right. Um, but this gives me the most flexibility to yeah. adjust the fit if I need to and to um, make sure that I don't accidentally like cut something, cut the, the lid too big for the hole, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Or vice versa, like. Um, yeah, you don't, I'd rather sew it on and then adjust from there because I can't mess it up. This part's a little tricky. <laughs> this part's really close up. <laughs> I, have, I have to like peer at it as I'm doing yep. it. Yeah, you do you. We'll get there. Don't worry. Okay. All right. We're okay. doing it live kids. <laughs> We're making it work. Literally. Um, the seam allowance on the bean part is going to be super tiny, really close to that notch. And then it's going to be really big on the bottom. So after I have okay. this, pin, I'll flip it over and I'll show you where the pins are. So that's meh, that's pretty even, I think. I'm sorry. I just like head butted my camera. I think it looks really good. Okay. So there we go. And so gonna... did you deal with the notch part at all? Uh, sort of. I, um, I haven't, I didn't pin the notch. It just like lays underneath that little V right there. Oh, okay. And then you're going to stitch it down. Okay. But here's what the inside looks like. And you can see. Oh, wow. That are, is much bigger. Yeah. You give yourself a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of room for error. Yeah. <laughs> because this is the part where if you're going to make a mistake, you're going to make a mistake here. Quite honestly. All right. So I'm done with my knee. I'm going to readjust my camera so that it's not showing you my dirty floor. Mm -ish. Okay. All right. 
Is that? I'm gonna. Pull. You can go in a little bit, maybe. Yeah. I have I have one of those like gooseneck clamps, and so I have to just like mold. Yeah. It. And then it bounces as I do. Oh, come on. All right. Ask me another question as I try to figure this out. All right. 20 questions. <laughs> if you could learn any one skill in the world without trying, matrix style, what would you pick? I think I would play an instrument. Oh, that's a good one. That's something I've never been able to like pick up, but mm -hmm. I think I would love to play like the piano or the guitar or something and like not yeah. have to not have to worry about it. But then I think my secondary one would definitely be some kind of martial art. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. I, um, I play the flute. That's cool. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I haven't done that since like high school or college. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So now okay. we're going to sew. All right. We're going to do basically the same stitch that we did to attach the points lining or huh you could do a solid slip stitch. And I'm gonna show you the salt, like the, the legit, what I call a slip stitch because it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna take my little, um, this is um, a, a little stitch through the back fabric, through the, the body fabric. Yep. And I come through and I do a little sideways stitch through the fold. Can you do it slightly closer to the camera? Uh -huh. So. Yep. Through the back. I'm going to take that pin out through the fold. Yep. How big are these stitches? These are not as small as you would think. I would say. Oh, that's much better. About, yeah. I have like six to eight per inch. Yep. Yeah. Sewing right there is perfect. We can see it really well. Oh, good. Okay, good. Cause I can see this too. <laughs> perfect. Everybody's happy. All right. So this this part's a little bit tedious just because like your thread gets wrapped around your thumb's chimney and like your pins get in the way and you have to go slow, but um, yeah. So that's, that's okay. After this, there's just one big long fitting and hem, right? And then you're all good. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna show you how to fell the thumb into your thumb seam. Oh, okay, that sounds good. Because that on the linen and on silk that needs to be done unless you have a lining. Yep. Or it's gonna get super frayed. But okay. if you have wool, this is another reason the wool is so nice. You don't have to do anything. You just slip it on and then it's done. Someone is like, is it too late to join this 80 minutes in? No, actually you're in like the one hard part right now. So the tricky part. you're, in, you're yeah. in the perfect spot to join in because everything else isn't that complicated. Also, this will be live forever for you so you can watch it later. And I think I might put like a URL on my kits from now on and be like, hey. Yeah. Cause I do, get a lot of, I do get a lot of, um, people that can text me with questions and that's something else. Like I am small enough and not that busy. So if you do have questions on my kits, like get in touch with me, I'll help you. Yeah. Somebody bought a bonnet kit. Oh, like for Christmas or something and could not for the life of them figure out what I meant when I said something in like one of the brim instructions. And so I just like, made her some videos and sent them <laughs> oh that's really kind yeah most most etsy sellers guys especially the ones in the historical costuming community are pumped to talk to you about their products and like how to do things and whatever you need help so. you want something custom like let me know yeah you want a custom kit you want something in silk with that doesn't come in silk but i have wool and you want this just let me know because chances are i do have the right stuff and can put it together for you do you have any like cool things you're thinking about working on in the future for your oh, shop? A bunch that are in the pipeline. Um, we, I just released a flame stitch pinball kit that oh, was yeah. developed by my friend Blair, who's amazing. Um, and um, I, I teased that and I got so many people being like, we want wallets. So we're also doing a flame stitch wallet kit. That's awesome that um I did the needlepoint for it and it took me like 46 hours whoa and now I'm like I've lost steam and I don't want to put it together now <laughs> no you're so close though you did all the work already no I did the hard part and now I'm like I just have to like basically put a lining on it and bind it and that's it and I just I haven't for like a week 
<laughs> it's like how we all don't want to do the closures and it's like literally the only thing that would make it no done. Hems. No hems, no buttons, right? Yeah. Um, so that's coming. Um, I have a collaboration in the works with Kate from Willoughby and Rose. And we need, I want to like talk with her a little bit more before I announce that. Um, and then I have two new kits that are coming um, to my shop besides the wallet kit. We're going to have um, a patchwork pocket kit where we're going to do some English paper piecing, mm -hmm. which is a really, really fun technique. I don't know if anyone has tried that where you, um, you basically baste your pattern pieces to your pattern. Like you cut out your pattern and then you baste the fabric to it. And then you just like lay the edges together and you whip stitch on the seam allowance. And then you get these like beautifully crisp lines. Oh, that's awesome. And um, so that's happening. Um, I'm not sure when exactly that will be. I, I want to have that out before Christmas because I think that would be really cool. Um, I would like to just shill for you right here. Jess's kits are amazing to give other costumers for Christmas presents and birthday presents. Just so you guys know, I have given them away as presents before and it is kind of like giving your friend homework, but it's also <laughs> super fun and highly recommended. Thank you so much. Um, someone is asking if you offer fleece for people who are allergic to wool. And I think the answer is no, but I'm going to let you answer that. Um, because the focus is like historically acceptable, I don't have any synthetic fibers. I only have the wool, but what I can recommend and what I could do for you, if you wanted to, um, message me per like personally, um, I could include, um, linen for a full lining so that the wool wouldn't be on your skin. Yeah, you can also, yeah, definitely silk or linen is a good option as well. Also, you could get the pattern and then. And then just make it out of your own. Just fleece. make it out of whatever fleece you want. Yeah. Yeah. The pattern at the moment comes with instructions for the wool, which is the easier one to construct because you don't have to do any seam finishes. Um, but I'm adapting the pattern instructions to be for both. Um, so linen and silk go together the exact same way if they're unlined. Mm -hmm. um, and then wool is just, is that with no seam finishes. And, and fleece is pretty much like wool. Like you don't have to worry about. Yeah. You don't have finishing. to leave like, a red edge with that. And it yeah. Be um, okay. So I'm going to ask you one question. Okay. If you had a time machine, would you go back in time or into the future? I would go back. And this is interesting that you bring this up. Cause I was talking with my dad who just, he's in his late sixties. And he said that when he was younger, his answer was always he wanted to go back. And now that he's older, he wants to go to the future and like see his future um, and like his future generations and see how they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, where would you go? I think I'd stay here and just check and see like what was going on like a hundred years ago. That's cool. And yeah. that's, when I do historical stuff, I always say I want to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there because like, I like having rights as a woman. Yeah. I like being able to like see yeah. a doctor and not be called crazy. I like things like toilet paper and antibiotics. Those and are my favorite things. Toilet paper and antibiotics. And air <laughs> What's going on? You're, you're re-threading? I'm re-threading because I ran on thread. All righty. I'm, I'm so glad to get to see this. This is so, whoa. Oh. Oh no. <laughs> oh, sorry. My microphone just ate it. That's so nice. Wow. I'm using this bougie mic that I use for podcasting to talk to you guys today so that the sound is better, but sound is very clear. weird balance thing that you have to do that like somewhat doesn't work. <laughs> oh, come on. Pins in the way. Pins are always in the way. They're always in the way. The cows eat them for hay. <laughs> I, I got obsessed when my cousin, so my cousin is eight years younger than me. And when she was born, I was right at the right age to like want to play with her all the time. Cause she's like, you know, a baby and whatever. Yeah. So I got obsessed with we sing silly songs and I kind of still am. <laughs> so all those fun, like kid songs, I walk around the house singing all the time. My mom had the VHS tapes and we watched them all the time. Yeah, like, they went to the zoo and they sang all the animal songs and the one where they went to the farm and the one where they went to, uh, I think it was like the county fair. Oh, yeah. 
Oh my God. Oh my God. I need to find like some YouTube clips of that and just completely relive my childhood. Someone is asking, Rhonda is asking if you could go into the past for a week, what one thing would you bring back? What one thing would I bring back? Fabric. Fabric. Yeah. Yeah. When I would get some salvage woven linen and I would bring it back just to pet it. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, would you rather, this is someone else asking, would you rather be rich and live in the past or poor and live in the future? Uh, Goodness. All right. I'm going to say rich in the past. But? But I don't want to live in the past period. Yeah. Uh, But having money in any era means that you don't have to suffer in that era. Money doesn't buy happiness, but it sure helps. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So what's going on here? So now I'm going to prepare to fell this and I'm going to, in two parts, trim this. So this is the trick to thumbs is that you can't do it all at once. It has to be done like incrementally in little steps. And be patient. Yes. So I'm going to just trim out this, the body part of the seam allowance. So I'm not, you can open it up and see like that's the seam allowance of the thumb. And this is from the body. I'm going to trim the body away. I'm trimming okay. actually pretty close. I'm going to nip off the top of the notch and I'm going to come, you can see right here, mm-hmm. it's about like maybe three eighths of an inch. And that's about how low I want to get it all the way around. Okay. And I'm going to flat fell this. So these are my little unicorns and very carefully trim that away. Make sure that as you're cutting, you're only cutting that piece. You don't want to cut, um, you don't want to cut the thumb seam allowance because then you won't have anything to fold over and to encase your raw edges. If you were doing wool, you can just trim the whole thing away. I would make it slightly deeper, maybe like a quarter of an inch. And if you want it, you could overcast it just to overcast it like with a whip stitch but yep. you don't. Do. Okay. So that's what I cut out. So I have a bean and a moon are <laughs> my extra bits here. And if you've ever, all right, this is funny. If you've ever bought a, um, a pinball kit for me and it came with, um, stuffing, you're going to yep. notice shapes like this out of wool because I save them <laughs> and I shove them in there as stuffing. <laughs> okay. So now I'm trimming this and I want this to be, this is the thumb seam allowance. And I want this to be twice as wide as that. Right. In some places it won't be, and that's fine. In some places it's going to be more. So then you trim it down like that. And then up here, it's like hardly any, and that's totally fine. All right. I still have my thread. I haven't cut my thread yet. It's still attached here. So I'm going to hold it right here. And what I have found works is if you go counterclockwise from Mm -hmm. the point. Yeah. So I'm going to take my thumb and I'm going to finger press this up. I suppose you could technically do this on an ironing board, but I feel like it's so tight and fiddly that it might just be more trouble than it's worth. I have this crazy micro iron. (gasps) Like a little crafty iron? Yeah. And it's really good for like tiny corners and like roughs and like random stuff like that and I could see that being useful here but yeah. finger pre- especially for linen finger mm-hmm. pressing is all good finger pressing is great for wool you don't need to do it for silk silk is a beast I almost just swore I love the way silk looks but I hate fiddly sewing with silk dude it's- I love s- silk taffeta sewing that's like my favorite sewing silk taffeta in circles though is not fun yeah okay that's fair You're you're totally fair And the only time I ever sew with silk is when I'm doing like really fiddly, stupid things. Okay. So now we're going to do a quilting trick that I learned called a needle fold. Yay. A needle fold. A needle fold. So you take your needle and fold, you use, okay. You are kind of, I'm not not sure how to even describe what I'm doing. I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to try to describe it. So I'm pinching this, I'm going to take the edge of my needle and push down into and like over top of. And then use the needle to fold it. 
Use the needle to fold it, yes. <laughs> okay. So that's a quilting technique when you do appliques and stuff. You like use it to get a really nice tight fold because my finger won't fit in there, but the needle will. Like that. Yeah. I'm going to use a very tiny, I guess it's technically a whip stitch, but it's like a hem stitch too. Yep. And I'm picking They're up all the same needle. thing. They're all that's the same. Funny. I'm picking up a single thread and coming yes. through. If you're a lefty, go clockwise. Yeah. If you're left, go. If you're left hand, go clockwise. Yeah. And yes, Amy, tuck in the edge. Use using your needle. It's easier to use your yeah. needle. Um. Basically, what you want to do is you have. All right. So this this is the outer hem. This is the inner hem. You're gonna fold it like this and then fold it down. Yep. I just bent my wrist backwards when I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm so smart. Now your finger folding. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is fiddly. So as I'm doing it, I'm folding it and then I'm actually kind of pulling here so that I make sure that this seam on the outside is very, very flat as I'm stitching it. Yeah. I don't want it to pucker. And remember, like if you do get it puckery or something happens, it's historically accurate. Oh yeah. What yeah. One of the most wonderfully comforting things I ever, ever got to do was I went into the collections at, in Williamsburg when I was working there and um, Linda Baumgarten was there and she had this waistcoat and it was this beautiful embroidered waistcoat and we were studying it because we were going to try to make a replica and she's like, do you guys want to see something? And the stitching had come away at one of the interior seams and so she could see the inside of it and it was the jankiest giant running stitch mixed with whip stitch mixed with, it was like a five-year-old had sewn it. And I was so amazingly comforted. I was like, oh, people were made, like, people weren't perfect. Like, people If anyone wants to see this tomorrow, I have a live at five Pacific with Abby Cox and Kenna, and they are both um, extant garment collectors and they're going to be talking about um the myth of the 18 inch waist but they're going to be showing you extant garments and i'm sure you're going to see a lot of guts pictures and they are a mess <laughs> like just like but what had happened and i hadn't realized that it was a thing at that point but you could buy pre-embroidered panels and then you assembled them yourself yeah and so that's what happened. Like it was professionally embroidered and then someone took it home and just like janky whip stitched a back on it so they could wear it. Uh, what is your stitch length here? Um, tiny. Let's see. Mine are always going to be little. One, two, three, four, eh, like 10. Okay. Eight to 10 an inch. Just because this part gets an awful lot of friction. Yep. Yep. So the the rule of the rule of thumb thumb <laughs> in, in stitching is that if it's going to get a lot of wear, the stitches need to be really close together. If yep. it's not going to get a lot of wear, they can be further apart. And you will you will see this from the outside, so catch as little of the outside as you can. Yeah, like a single thread. And um if you own the book Fitting in Proper, there's a pair of mitts in there that are um it's the cotton pair that um I think it's the only extant cotton pair that we know of. Um, and they use this seaming technique on the thumb. And it's really cool because I've never seen this, this in person, but you can see the felling of the thumb seam from the outside of the mitts. Oh, that's cool. Because it's thin enough. And I'm like, oh, I know how to do that. Amy says a pucker is just a spontaneous pleat. Indeed, there you go. Amy. Indeed. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> this is fascinating. I'm so glad you're interested. I'm I'm going to go back and watch this live like all the time. I will get my own view count up. <laughs> <laughs> Mark the like the minutes where you, the thumb goes in. Oh yeah. I I actually can do um bookmarks on videos like once it goes to the regular. Oh. I think so I could I could probably put like bookmarks in for people. <laughs> that would be like if you need help with it's like a directory if you need help with the thumb so you do know that when google um indexes youtube videos if you ask google like in the the box if you ask it an actual question and it gives you a google result it indexes 
people's videos to the minute that they're actually talking about it. So if you click on that Google link, yeah, if you click on that Google link, sometimes you'll get into a video and it'll be like 10 minutes into the video where they're actually talking about the thing because they have, you know, software that does all the translation. So they know everything you're saying in the video. Right. And so they can index that time, which I think, I mean, I'm, I think that's amazing. Both amazing and terrifying. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have lots of friends who work for Google. I know all kinds of scary stuff. Like they're so smart and terrifying. (laughs) One of their headquarters is in Pittsburgh where I live. And um, my sister's ex-husband is a a web designer. Yeah, me too. Computer engineer. And he went to interview for Google and he said that his interview was seriously, they put him in a conference room and wrote an equation on a board and then left. Yep. That is totally normal. Two hours and he was like, ah. So I live in Silicon Valley and I'm a a web producer also. Um, And it used to be that if you wanted to apply to to Google, you had to take like, what is the equivalent of a four hour online exam before they even consider whether or not they want to look at your application. Wow. Yeah. Um, And I worked at this, uh, I worked at a company called Symantec. They made um, Norton antivirus. Yeah. Um, And I worked in a building and every single building all the way around us was Google buildings. So we got to be friends with a bunch of the Googlers. They have these really funny bikes that have six people on them and they're circular and everybody faces towards the center. And there's one person that drives the bike and everybody else is pedaling. So six people can go somewhere. And so they used to go, there's a specialties, which is a um, sandwich shop down the street from where we all worked. And you'd see this giant Google bike going down the road with six people on it. It was very amusing. Um, <laughs> I remember, um, so I, I'm from Pittsburgh. I live, I live in Pittsburgh. And um, Carnegie Mellon, the School of Engineering, is where, like, there's a lot of, a lot of, like, AI and robotics stuff that happens in there. And um, I remember I was in college in Virginia taking a class on like intro to computing or whatever. And we watched this video that was talking about self-driving cars. Now this was in like 2005. Oh yeah. um, In the video, the guy was like, we're going to take it out on the street. We don't know what it's going to do. It might just crash spontaneously. And they were just like driving around down by the campus on the streets. And I was like, uh, what? And of course I recognized it because it was my city, but I was like, this is, this is insanity. Why is this happening? So Google bought Waymo, Waymo, which is an electric car or a self-driving car company. Mm-hmm. And they were doing all their testing in Mountain View where I worked. And so we'd be driving, driving to lunch or whatever. And we would just see some guy sitting there reading a book in the front seat of his car as he's driving yeah. down the road. <laughs> uh, someone asked if they can use pre-quilted fabric for 18th century mitts. Um, I have not seen and am not aware of any extant quilted mitts but sure yeah like don't you don't let what we have concern you like we can't prove stuff we don't have an example for but that we can't negatively prove something right like we can't prove what they didn't do so if it if it was possible they probably did it right someone did it so i would say feel free do the thing go for it um the only thing i would say is it's super thick so you would either have to um like grade the edges of it or bind it with something like a like a bias tape binding i would bind the the edges instead of like hemming hemming it yep because to fold it's just going to make it too bulky all right what are you doing there at the end you're really close to the camera i am okay I'm blind. Um, I'm just, I'm needle folding. I'm just tucking it in as best I can. There might uh-huh. be little like threads that stick out. It might be wonky. It might be weird. Don't, it's just, on the inside. Don't worry about it. It's on the inside. It doesn't matter. And also this part of your hand won't really be seen from the outside because your thumb tends to stay close to your hand. It doesn't like yeah walk around like a Barbie. Yeah. So make it so it's comfortable for your thumb to be on. Mm-hmm. So I'm just doing that. I'm also going to do a couple little, like, I don't even know what to call this stitch. Just like a attach these two things together kind of deal. Uh, Kelly says, what about hand knitted mitts? I'm, I'm like, what about them? Yes, do that. <laughs> they do exist. Somebody yeah. has a pattern for it. I don't know if it, it might be Mill Farm has a knitting pattern for them. Uh-huh. Um, there is a school of thought that I have politely bowed out of conversations with. <laughs> 
that woolen mitts were only knitted and not sewn? But we have, what? We have examples. There are no known extant examples of woolen mitts. My okay. theory on that is they got worn to death and thrown away. Yeah. Um, however, or moth mothed to death. Okay, I what does that look like? Okay, so that is what it looks like from the outside. That's what it looks like from the inside. Okay, let me see the outside again. The outside. So you can kind of see it, but I picked up a single thread, and so it's yeah. really difficult to see. But you can see that like ridge where it's sewn. Yep. If you iron that down, that'll help too. Mm -hmm. I just All right. Finger press it. Okay. So if, you, if you stick that on your hand, what does that look like? It looks like a, a mitten. Look. Look it. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Okay. okay. Um, one of the things that when we were talking about like the thumb, the reason it's so weird is because the thumb itself actually covers the entirety of this muscle in your hand. So You're that it neat. has flexibility. It's not just here. Your thumb yeah. is actually, your thumb starts here. I call that your, th your, your thumb chicken. Cause you it looks like a drumstick. It does. It's like a little ham. So yeah, so that's that. And then that's that. All right. So now we have fitting. Now we're going to finishing. Fit. Um, if I was to do embroidery, it, when I make them myself, now is when I do the embroidery and my signature design is three lines on the palm that end in leaves. It's a three inch long line that starts and you can see the seam where I'm starting it. Mm -hmm. So three inches over half an inch, three inches. I love clear rulers over half an inch, three inches. And then I mark the bottom and then I would stitch that on with a, I use a stem stitch and then like a daisy stitch at the end, like a loops. Yep. I'm not going to do it now because of time. Yeah, we have, I mean, this, it, it can go over two hours. <laughs> it's, um, we have 15 minutes ish, -ish oh, perfect. Okay. but yeah. All right. So we're going to do fitting. So there's two ways to do fitting. And one is um, like a pin and pray. And one is a measure pin and pray. Um, What's a so pin and pray? Pin and pray. I and mean, you flip the whole thing inside out. Uh-huh. Lay it flat. Move these for a second. Lay it flat. You have three measurement points that you need to be concerned with. One is around your knuckles over your open, um, open hand over your knuckles, which is right here. One is your wrist over the bone right here. And one is the widest part of your forearm, which is the hammy bit right here. If you pull your hand back and you flex it, or if you, it's weird. If you make like a backwards fist, this will yep. flex and you oh, want yeah. it here. So it's the fattest part. Okay. Um, on me, it's seven and a quarter, six, and then like nine and three quarters. Okay. Um, so on the mitt, you kind of like correspond, you kind of eyeball it and you see mm -hmm. how the thumb is sitting forward where your thumb would naturally sit. Yep. That's where it wants to be. Do you want me to figure out what my measurements are? Yeah, do that. I'm going to, I'm going to do the pin and pray and then we'll adjust it to your measurements. So you do your measurements and then okay. you tell me. So I'm going to stick a pin in there-ish. I'm going to stick a pin in there-ish. And then here's where I've discovered where the, um, the wrist bites in is directly underneath where the thumb is. So if you karate chop it at the thumb, that's where you need to put a pin. Like right, so my hand is touching the thumb seam right there. That's where my, my wrist is gonna be. So I'm gonna put three and I'm gonna put one more here just because that's a big open spot. And then I'm gonna try it on. I am eight, six and three quarters. Okay. Okay. And I'm getting the last one. Um, looks like my biggest spot is mm, 10 and three quarters. Okay. When you make these, um, you make them with zero ease because they stretch. Okay. So, all right, this isn't too bad. I have it on. I can tell that this pin right here is where it should be. This can be moved over. And this one is not quite, this one should come up a little bit higher, I guess. Yep. You put it on and you just like, you feel where it goes. If you have a marking tool and I'm doing this because it's inside out, it's on my right arm, my right hand. Um, I can actually mark 
with my little erasable yep. where this needs to be. You want to pull it, not so that it's like so tight that it's like cutting off your circulation, but it should be tight enough that it stands up on its own. Um, one of the things that I have noticed, and this is just my observation, I have not seen this 100% necessarily supported in extant examples, is that you can leave a vent. I leave probably about three quarters of an inch of this, bo this bottom seam open. And that allows me to get this part right here super tight, but allows for the flexibility, and it's hard to show, but it allows for the flexibility of the movement of the arm without it either cutting off my circulation or being too tight. Yep. That makes sense. So that's my, my, I've done this a hundred times and this is what I've discovered. <laughs> okay. So there's that. Um, so that's pin and pray and definitely pin it and then put it on. Don't try to pin it on yourself because that's not going to work. <laughs> um, if your hand is smaller than seven inches around, you can actually take the palm part and shift it over. It's going to make your um, point come a little bit further towards your palm, but the other option is to cut that off completely. And that, what we do see in historical examples is this happens sometimes, but this does not happen. So, I mean, do whatever you want, but that's um, what I have found. Um, all right. So now I'm going to show you how to do it with measurements. All right. So hand is eight. This is how I find the half of things. Are you ready? Tape measure, old increase, half. I mean, I know. Oh, wow. Yeah. But there's no math involved. So because it's on the bias, it's weird. OK. So that's where eight is. That's not open. That's where eight is, six and three quarters, six and three quarters is here. So there, oh, hey, that's about where it needs to be. Um, and then 10 and three quarters, 10 and three quarters. Make sure it's on the edge. There, okay. And so now I'm going to take my, I could use, I should use a straight edge. <laughs> People are also asking if you want to talk about uh, fitting, if it has a lining, I assume it's just the same, right? Exactly the same. Yeah. You fit the lining, then fit the, the front. Um, there's actually two ways to do it. And I'm honestly not certain. I have never been able to see the inside of a lined pair of extant mitts. So I cannot tell you historically which way was preferred over the other. Um, what I did with these was just a full on bag lining. So I finished both of the sets of mitts and then I just um, like slip stitched it on the hem here and around the edge here and then all around the edge of the thumb totally legitimate. It's contained. There's no raw edges. Um, another way to do it would be to attach, um, do the attachment here and the attachment here. And then, um, sew the whole thing as one and then like fell over the seams on the inside. But I feel like that would be kind of bulky. So those are the two options for making that happen. So is the seam that you're about, you're just going to slip stitch and fell? Is that what's happening here? I'm going to back stitch it and then um, press it open and then fell it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so if you had some really thin fabric like silk taffeta, you could French seam that. Yeah. You could. Yes. Um, yeah. French seams are not something that are really used in the 18th century. They're, um, they start to come into play in like the 1820s, 1830s, you see them more. Um, but in the 18th century sewing that I have seen, um, what would be more typical would be felling. So that's my elbow, sorry. Um, so that. Um, yeah. I know I, I had you do a French seam at the thumb. That's because it's just so small that that yeah. I have found is less bulky. 
Um, you could you could absolutely do a French seam on the side here. And as you're saying that, my mind is kind of blown because I'm like, yeah, that would be so much easier. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna show you how to do it with felling. And um, remember, the, kids, historically adequate is fine, especially for the inside. Exactly. And if it's you wearing it, like, who are you? Who who do you need to prove that it? Yeah. Is? I mean, legitimately, sometimes there are times when you do need to do that. Yeah. But that's a, that's a minority of the time. <laughs> and if someone comes at you and attacks you, like the costume police show up, send them over to me because I got words for them. <laughs> send them to Noelle because she'll send No them. drama mama is on the case. <laughs> <laughs> we all, all appreciate right. that. I all have right. one last 20 question for you while you finish that. Oh, okay, go. What fictional, fi yeah, no. What fictional <laughs> character do you identify it most with and why? I don't know. I spent a very long time when I was a child thinking I was Laura Ingalls. Oh, someone in, in the comment section right now is named Laura Ingalls. You are kidding me. Hello, but, Laura Ingalls. But not, not that one, I would assume. <laughs> I actually, when I went to college, one of my first costuming professors was her three times great granddaughter. Mm -hmm. um, so that was an awful lot of fun bonding time. And she was like, yeah, that's my, she actually, no, she was related to um, Almanza Wilder. Um, oh, okay. But so through marriage, she was related to Laura Ingalls. And I was like, what? Um, Oh, I can so, talk about like. So you identify with this person the most. Identify. I don't know that I identify with her the most though. Cause I feel like in um, literature, I always am drawn to the like big fun. I'm going to go do it characters, but I'm actually like the sidekick character. Like yeah. in the Laura Ingalls books, I'm definitely Mary. And in like little women, I'm Meg. <laughs> like, I'm 100% oh, Meg. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm Jane Bennett. I'm not Lizzie Bennett. So um, I am Joe, like a hundred percent. I mean, obviously, but we could be sisters. We could be okay. sisters. Um, I think Eleanor Dashwood. Yeah. My my uh, um my Jane Austen character definitely. I haven't read an awful lot of books where I wanted to be in them recently. Mm. Like I don't think I would want to be in the Harry Potter world because that's once you get to look like, book six and seven, it's a horrific place to be. Yeah. People don't really think about those books. as like, they're like, oh, they're so awesome and magical. I'm like, those are scary AF actually. They're like in the middle of a war and on the run for like two years. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think I'd like to do that. Any of like the dystopian set novels, I don't think I'd like to go there. Um, you know, although like I'm Herm Hermione Granger also for sure. <laughs> like I am that girl. I don't think I have a character equivalent in the Harry Potter books that I have like truly identified with. Not like a single character. I'm tying a knot and getting a new thread. Okay. PSA bias is weird and bias will do strange things. And if bias wants to make a tuck, just take your pins out and say, no, go flat. And then it sometimes will listen. No spontaneous pleats kids. <laughs> Not on this part. I mean, on the thumb, that's fine. But on this part, I would say try to avoid because. And it's it's biased so you can kind of massage it. Work. Just kind of stretch it, pull it, tell it you want it to stay there. Usually it listens. Once it's on your hand, no one's going to see anything weird anyway. Don't worry about it too much. Honestly, the vast majority of even the really nice ones that I've seen, like the historical ones, are pieced. Like yeah. they have a giant piece in them. Like they're beautifully embroidered and then just have this weird thing just like tacked on like nobody cared <laughs> nobody back then cared you should nope. be. no you have to um uh, become one with the tiny imperfections that make prove that it was made by the indigenous people of wherever exactly. this is a fight club quote for people who <laughs> what's your favorite movie my favorite movie is the princess bride Oh my God. That's awesome. 100%. That's a great one. I've definitely thought about that one a lot. Yeah. 
I am the weirdo. My favorite. I have two favorite movies. They are the polar opposite movies. One is Fight Club, <laughs> and the and the and and that tells you a lot about who I am. It's like dark humor, um, and and the other one is uh the Nightmare Before Christmas. No, well, there you go. Yeah, although Emma twenty twenty is fast becoming one of those. I don't. Okay, I'm gonna get so much crap right now from the pineapples. I don't love Jane Austen. Like I don't. Um, I I love the pineapples, <laughs> um, but I I don't dislike them. I just am not like obsessed with them the way everybody else seems to be. But man, that movie was gorgeous. Like I want every piece of clothing from that movie. Have you seen it? <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. No, it's Girl. on my list. Um, in my house, I I am one of four in my household and um, I have two small children. And so I very rarely get to choose the programming that is on my TV. After they go to bed, <laughs> Emma, Emma 2020, I'm telling you, it'll okay. be the best two hours of your recent life. Okay, of my recent, well, that's a very low bar. <laughs> if, if you can, if, if you enjoy like costumes, like I don't, I don't even love Regency, but this movie has made me love Regency and it's made me love Jane Austen. Like it's done the way it should yeah. be, like where she's, it's snarky, but not too snarky, very sweetly snarky. And then the costumes are just devastating. Like I freeze frame and take photos of my screen. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Highly recommend. Does anyone in the comment section have any questions that they want to ask Jess or I, but mostly Jess? Uh, I'm getting some Jane Austen fans here. Lots of Luna Lovegoods in the audience today. She's a fun character. Yeah, she really is. I really love her. She's the sweetest. I also have this like cork board in my room that has entirely stuff that my friends have sent me like my costuming friends have sent me it's just all pinned on there like random little bits like literally the packaging to morgan's um things that she sends me kind of stuff are on there, little tassels just random stuff and and so i always feel like it's luna's like friends thing all the time that's awesome uh people want to know what the vel airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow is <laughs> um, what Emma 2020 outfit would would you make uh well I mean the obvious answer is that yellow police that's just the most badass jacket I've ever seen in my life but actually there there is just so much that like little pink Spencer is so gorgeous the hats are gorgeous the purses they have these hand knitted purses that are just amazing in it yeah uh, Jess, what projects are you doing for yourself right now? Or is it all business stuff? Um, I actually, um, one of the undercover blessings of the pandemic has been um, that I've actually had time to work on things for myself. And um, if any of you follow me on Instagram and you saw my stories yesterday, you know that the thing I need I need to do for myself is to make another pair of shorts. Um because I accidentally melted a pair in bleach yesterday. <laughs> that was amazing, actually. I was just <laughs> like, yeah, I do that. We do things, we mess up. Um, but I do have, um, I have an awful lot of things that I wanna make for me that are like, I have the stuff for and they're prepped. I just have to like actually sit down and do it. And um, Edwardian is on my radar. Um, I mean, who could look at um, Carolyn Dowdles and um, like James Delamode and um, Lauren uh, Mark, uh, Lauren Marks, their Edwardian floof, and not want to also make Edwardian floof? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so that is on the docket, and I have I have like tentative post pandemic plans to um, uh, go to the Frick House, which is in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was like a huge. Um, turn of the century, like steel and coal baron, lots of money and lots of old pretty houses are still here. Yep. And um, it's a it's a house museum and they have a little tea cafe thing. Um, and um, I, I am planning to do an Edwardian tea at the house. That's amazing. All over God, I wish Pittsburgh. I was in town for that. And if you want to come to Pittsburgh and do that, we'll set a date. 
I mean, yeah. it's possible. Like if we're out of the pandemic, I'm in. Done. All right. I will let you know. I'll give you details. Um, um, someone's asking about what do you, what do you do if you have differently sized arms slash wrists, like significantly, because you can't really do it on the other hand. You, um, measure individually and do the, the, um, the measure and the measure and fit. Don't put it on your hand. Cause once it's inside out, it's got to go in the opposite hand. So, um, you can pin it and then flip it right side out, or you can put it. Okay. I'm going to go back and do this in a way that makes sense. Instead of flipping it um, inside out to pin and put it on, do it right side out, put your pins where you want them to go, and then transfer your measure, your markings to the inside. So if I have a pin and um, I'll, I'll just say, like, if this is the outside and I have a pin, take this off. I have a pin like this, and this is where I need it to be on the right side of the garment. I will leave the pin in and then kind of like open it up like this and then take my marker or a pencil or a piece of chalk and mark where the pin is on both sides of the fabric. So when I take it off, the marking is still on the inside and I can match them back up. So that, that makes sense. Helpful. Yeah. Um, or because I make mitts for people I've never met, they send me their measurements and just take the measurement and lay it flat and do it like that. Yep. Do a left and a right and just make sure that you are actually putting the left measurements on the left mitt because that's something that I do all the time is mix that up. Yeah. Um, someone else is asking if you can make these out of stiff lace. I don't see why not. I say do it. Go do for it. it. Don't worry about whether or not we have extant examples. Make them pretty. Make it happen. Yeah. Someone else is asking about Emma 2020. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. It's on Amazon now? Uh, yeah, it's it's not prime free, but it's definitely like rentable or whatever. I, I bought it on Amazon Prime because I watch it like twice a week. I think it might be on Stars, and I randomly have a subscription to oh. Star because when I started my business, I needed to know what Outlander stuff looked like because yep. we're asking for it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, I, I still have it because accidentally I just keep like forgetting to cancel it. So, um, yeah. Uh, I have not been able to watch the latest season of Outlander after the past season. I was, I think I'm done. Yeah. Um, I call it the rapey show. I can't, I can't get past that. Like st stop raping people. Just stop. Just, just Literally, stop. I, I watched it. My sister watched it. And then I watched it several years after and I like binged through it. And I was like live streaming, texting her the entire time I was watching. It, and I was like, God, how? Okay, there was a scene where like all five of the main characters were together and Jen was like sexually assaulted, sexually assaulted, sexually yep. assaulted, sexually assaulted. They should just have a support group. And I was like, this can't be, I'm sorry now. The like man on man rape that went on for an entire episode graphically was the one that I was just like, I why? I, I have actually watched all of it, but it's more like I just sit there in horror. Are we all done? Is that what's happening? That theme is done. So now what needs to happen? All right, so I'm gonna point out that I stopped a finger width here. When okay. I teach home sewing, I teach people to measure and know approximate measurements based on their hands. Yeah. Because you're never, this is again me. I'm never going to lose my hand. Yeah. I'm never going to accidentally leave it at home. So I know that like this right here is about half an inch. Yep. That, that's that. This is about an inch. So yep. there. This is about two inches. Like, meh, all right, ish. Or wait, it's from here to here is three inches. Like I, okay. I know things on my hands yeah so I encourage you to to measure and discover your hands <laughs> and then um use them so like a finger width is a perfect bent excellent and then that and then what I would do here and you'll see because these are a one size thing I do have an ex an, an awful lot of seam allowance which is good that's what you should have the wrist is going to have the most if you have the kit in the instructions it will tell you that you're going to have a lot of seam allowance if you're going to fell it trim it down to about three eighths. Anything smaller than that, you're gonna have trouble rolling twice. Oh, you're felling them both each way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Probably I won't do all of that on camera. No, it's gonna take forever. Honestly, yeah. we can just like finish up chatting and I will do this and then I can like put a picture of the finished one. Excellent. Um, so, uh, Raphael has a question for you. Okay, go. Um, this, this gentleman is in my comments all the time and he is a really awesome dude. I really like him. Uh, what was the situation movie or clothing that drew you to this period? 
Felicity. Yeah. And Felicity. There wasn't really a movie movie, I feel like, that I was able to see because the one that had the best costumes from this period from when I was smaller is Dangerous Liaisons. Yep. With Glenn Close. And obviously, as a six-year-old, I was not allowed to watch that. <laughs> um, yeah. Have you watched Harlots yet? I have not. No. Again, I don't control the programming in my house. Oh, dude, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it's so good. That, so I'm going to have to like look into it. Yeah. The costumes in it are excellent. That's Honestly, funny. the thing that made me like 18th century was looking at all my other friends who like 18th century. Like, you know, it, was, it wasn't even like, it was just my friends or people on Instagram, you know? Yeah. There's an awful lot. The people that do 18th century on Instagram do it really, really well. Yeah. Like in a really beautiful, like beautiful way and I feel like 18th century clothes the um I like the working class stuff just as much as I like the fancy stuff yeah for sure I feel like the fit is just so beautiful and the silhouette is so flattering to everybody and the the pleating techniques I mean I'm a I'm a pleats like pleats are my favorite and the pleating techniques are just so cool. Like the way um, an English gown bodice is pleated just blows my mind. And I love it. And so that's definitely like a, a thing for me. Okay. Because I'm a dork and I like to not have to cut my thread if I don't want to. I start on this side of the vent, go yep. up, and then I turn it and I come back down. Yep. <laughs> And that is how I fell that scene. Um, I have one from another class that I was teaching that I've started doing this with, and I can just show you here. Like you just fold Flip it, it under, and you can do it with an iron. You can do it with pins. I just kind of do the like the inch that I'm going for, and then I hold it with my hand. Yep. And just stitch it down, just because like I don't want to have to get up. <laughs> Yeah, totally. The ironing board's all the way over there. I mean, if I don't have to, I'm not going to. And if I have this like at a child's birthday party or like a football game or something, I don't have an iron. So. All right. Well, that yeah. is making 18th century mitts with Jess, folks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip it. Even though it's not felled yet, I'm going to flip it and I'm going to put it on. And I'm going to give you a thumbs up here because here we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch us back to all of us so like they, they can see us again. Hi, okay. guys. Hi. Um, thank you very much for doing this. This is really awesome of you. And I really, really appreciate it. This Mostly, so I'm, I'm doing this video largely for me because <laughs> I want it. Honestly, I would have done this just for you. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Well, it was good to see everybody here in the chat. So we're going to say goodbye and just hang out for just a second while I stop this so that it can stop in an appropriate place because thank you all for coming and playing and sewing with us. Yeah. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of your time and I hope you guys learn stuff and we'll see you all soon.